what do you need most? And well, I wonder what, um, how your answer is today compared to maybe a year ago. I wonder what this time of lockdown has done to uh, change that answer. I think we might say things we'd never have thought that we would have said a year ago, like, well, uh, what I need right now is, is a haircut, or I'd like to uh, return to work, or I'd like to uh, hug my parents or my grandchildren. I want to just get out of the house. I, I want to see friends. I've even heard children say that they'd like to go back to school. I think more to see their friends than to uh, get an education, mind you. Now, I doubt we would have said those things a year ago. Um, I did a street poll a few years back and I asked people, what do you need most? And it seems to be the most common response was this, more money. It doesn't matter whether they look rich or poor. Uh, it seemed that an extra million would solve all the problems. But some said better health, still true today, I guess. Better relationships. Well, what do you need most? Jesus gives an answer which I think will surprise some people. Peter, the disciple of Jesus, definitely would not forget this event that took place in his own house. He wouldn't forget this. Mark wrote down what Peter remembered the day that something incredible happened. Someone ripped a hole in his roof. We find it in Mark chapter 2, which was read earlier in the online service. Um, Jesus returned to Capernaum from preaching in the neighboring towns and villages, and he's now back at Peter's home. Can you imagine this scene? Uh, imagine it was your house. Imagine if Jesus was coming to your house. I mean, what would you do? Probably get the vacuum cleaner out a bit, tidy up a bit. I don't know, maybe get the Bible off the shelf, lay it casually on the coffee room table. Well, word gets out. And uh, such is the popularity of Jesus that people start turning up at your door. Um, people start pushing into your house. The clergy appear, all very important people. They get ushered to the front, they get to sit on the sofa. Uh, and they're looking a little bit edgy, a little bit nervous. Because Jesus, this maverick preacher, was causing a stir. And they're wondering, what's it all about? Crowds and crowds of people are, are still coming up the path to your house. People have pushed in, shoved in to your home. And it's standing room only. And even then, there are still more people coming. It feels like the whole neighborhood wants to get into your house. And so you have to open the windows and the doors to get ventilation. And you can see people peering in and people trying to hear what's going on. And then silence descends as they strain to hear Jesus. As verse 2 says here, he preached the word to them. He was teaching the good news from God. The kingdom of God was very close to them and they needed to respond. Earlier we saw the impact of Jesus' preaching in the synagogues. The people were amazed at his teaching. And so I'd imagine there would have been intense concentration as they listened, except suddenly they started hearing digging above their heads. I mean, their house was different to our houses in Edinburgh. That our roofs are pointed, their roofs were flat. Roofs in Palestinian homes were accessed by an outside staircase. Uh, the roofs were made of, of beams of resting on external walls. They were cross-hatched by smaller poles and sticks covered with thatch and a surface of mud. Can you imagine this scene? There you are, trying to listen to Jesus, and there's a sound of somebody digging above your head. Twigs and branches are, are dropping down. And, and in a sense, it gets to the point where people can't pay attention to Jesus. They're looking up and they see this hole appear and four faces staring down into the room. And it suddenly gets dark and then something is lowered and lowered and lowered. And there is a paralyzed man on a mat in front of Jesus. What would he do? Well, let's consider before we get to Jesus. Let's think about these four friends what do you think about them? What do you see uh, as you look at this dirty, great big hole in the ceiling? Um, these are four men who are, what, a bunch of vandals? Or the most remarkable friends you could ever hope to have? Look at incredibly what Jesus sees as he looks up at their friends. Verse 5, Jesus saw their faith. I mean, what Jesus sees is their incredible confidence in him. 
I mean, to pull off a caper like this, ripping off the roof to get your friend to Jesus? That's extraordinary. And I presume the paralyzed man was also involved in this. And to speak of their faith was to include his faith when Jesus saw their faith. I mean, this is real faith. They showed that not only did they believe that Jesus could heal their friend, but that Jesus would heal him. They were absolutely confident. Why else would you rip open the roof? Maybe you've heard people talking about putting their faith in Jesus and wondered, well, what does that mean? Well, I think here's a picture of what true faith in Jesus is all about. It's not just about religious beliefs. It's knowledge that leads to action. And right throughout Mark, faith is not just about knowing facts. Faith it always produces life-changing action. Their faith in Jesus meant that no obstacle could get in their way of bringing their friend to Jesus. The crowds outside would have put some people off. They find another way. They head up the outside stairs. Uh, the roof might have held some people back. Not to them. They just rip it up, dig a hole and, and, and lower him through it. This is amazing faith in Jesus, isn't it? As Christians, we believe that Jesus is the only person who can change our lives forever. He's the only one who can meet our deepest needs. And, um, you know, if you're watching this today because a friend has sent you this link, then know this, you've got a really good friend, someone who cares enough about you to want you to introduce you to Jesus. And we have that privilege uh, of those who know Jesus to, to, to invite others to have a look. But let's look at the object of their faith. Let's look at Jesus. They'd lowered a paralyzed man in front of Jesus. What would he do? Well, take a look at verse 5. Jesus says the most shocking thing. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. I mean, this shocks for at least two reasons, doesn't it? I mean, it, firstly, it seems so inappropriate and, and irrelevant. He is paralyzed. You could imagine how his friends might have felt. Thanks for nothing. They didn't come for all this religious talk. I mean, they went to this great effort because this man is obviously his greatest need is that he's paralyzed. And, and they've heard that Jesus can heal people. But if Jesus is the son of God, then we had better listen carefully here. Nowhere do we find Jesus saying something trite or irrelevant. You know, imagine being rushed to the doctor with a heart attack and a broken finger. Now, how do you know whether you've got a good doctor or not, rather than a quack? Well, if the doctor starts treating your broken finger, then start calling for help. He's clearly not a very good doctor. He's not dealing with the most significant issue. And as Jesus looked down at this man, no doubt he saw a man with many needs. But like a good doctor, he chooses to deal with a man's greatest need. So when Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven, this teaches us that our greatest need is not more money. It's not a job. It's not health. It's not a, a better relationship. Our greatest need is for the forgiveness of our sins. The Bible says that, you know, we all sin. Often when people talk about sin, they talk about murder or theft or adultery, the big stuff. But let's think about the man before, before us, this paralyzed man. How much of this big stuff is he likely to have done? Now, we don't know his story and I don't want to make light of his situation, but he's not going to have much opportunity to get engaged with those sort of activities. The thing is that the Bible says that our sin is not just about our actions, but our thoughts and desires as well. Jesus warned that we could as easily commit the sins of adultery and murder with our minds and our words. See, sin is about our fundamental attitude and response to God. Sin is quite simply ignoring God, shutting him out of our lives, pushing him aside, putting us at the center. And our sins separate us from God forever. And Jesus is saying that our unforgiven sin is our most important problem. I mean, to cure this man of paralysis would maybe result in 30 years of healthy living, save him from 30 years of great suffering. To forgive his sin results in eternal life and saves him from eternity in hell itself. This is how glorious this promise of forgiveness of sins is. I wish I could impress upon you what an incredible thing Jesus is saying here. I think we, as a society, don't treat sin seriously. We treat it as a bit of a joke. 
but there are certain crimes that really disturb us. They waken in us the seriousness of sin. Terrorists detonating a bomb in a packed concert area or hearing of domestic abuse of women and children. There's something in, in most of us that cries out for justice and punishment against vile, evil acts. Well, the justice and the holiness of God demands that all sins must be punished and paid for. And only if we grasp this from the perspective of the Bible can we see what an incredible thing Jesus has extends this man. His sins completely forgiven. But what Jesus says here shocks, I think, for a second reason. And it's what it says about Jesus himself. The religious scribes knew their Bibles well. They're horrified. Look at verse uh, 6 and 7. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? They understood what Jesus was saying, that he was claiming to be God. You know, in the Bible, sin is essentially an offense against God. If I kick Liam in the shin, only Liam can forgive me. All our sin is ultimately against God and only he can forgive us. So for Jesus to claim to forgive sin, he is claiming to be God. I mean, they're not buying into that. So he's accused of being a blasphemer. It's a very serious charge in those days. By the end of the story, we'll see this is exactly the charge that condemns Jesus to death upon a cross that he is claiming to be God. Blasphemy, says the high priest. Now back here, Jesus sees the horror in their body language. Look what it says in verses 8 and 9. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. So what is easier to say you're forgiven or get up well for us we can't do the healing i mean there's some very exciting medical research being done today to seek to help paralyze people regain function but as yet there's still no cure for paralysis we can't do the healing so for us it is easier for us to say your sins are forgiven because let's be honest be honest no one can check that that's an internal thing about being right with god my guess is that none of us would go to someone in a wheelchair and say to them, get up. I mean, that's just a bit sick. But look at Jesus in verse 10. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Too right they hadn't. What an incredible event. <laughs> you can see why Peter would never forget this. For Jesus, the easier thing to say is, get up, take your mat and go home. The harder thing for Jesus to say is this, your sins are forgiven. For this meant he was committing himself to a future of great physical suffering in his crucifixion, to experience the judgment of God against sin upon himself on the cross, and then to prematurely die. That was the harder thing for Jesus. But right here, Jesus commits himself to doing it. Son, your sins are forgiven. I mean, that's an incredible statement, isn't it? Jesus gives this paralyzed man sort of a blank check that he's going to cover his sins. What do you need most? What do I need most? Our greatest need today is for this Messiah, Jesus. Only through coming in faith to him can we be taught the truth about God and our greatest need. And only through coming to trust Jesus can we know that our sins are forgiven. And you know what? He extends the same offer of forgiveness to you today. See, the great miracle here is not the healing of paralysis. This man was brought in hellbound. And he walks out heaven bound. I mean, that's the real miracle. So what do you need most? Believe it or not, it's not the end of lockdown. It's not for life to go back to normal. It is this, to have Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God at the center of your life. 
To have Jesus is to know that you are completely forgiven before God. To have Jesus is to know that you are loved and accepted into his kingdom. To, to not have Jesus means that you're still unforgiven. You're outside of his kingdom that will last forever. You know, my Christian friends, sometimes we struggle to accept and believe that we are truly forgiven for some of the sins of our past. They still haunt us. They fill us with doubt and shame. Listen again to Jesus. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. This is a, a story that tells us that he declared he could forgive sins. It was questioned that he had the authority to forgive sins. But Jesus wants them to know as an absolute fact that he has the authority of heaven to forgive sins. And so he absolutely demonstrates and validates this by healing this paralytic man with a command. And it's recognized that he did have the authority by all that witnessed this amazing event. They were all amazed and praised God. We have never seen anything like this before. And so my Christian friends know this as an absolute certainty. Jesus is the Son of Man who has God-given authority to forgive sins. He is God the Son who came uh, to take our sins upon the cross. He has the authority. He has the ability. He is willing to meet our greatest need for all who come to him by faith. And if you're trusting Jesus, substitute your name in verse 5. For me, it has these amazing words. Paul, your sins are forgiven. What an amazing person is Jesus, my Savior. If you're trusting him, you could put your word in there too. How utterly transforming this is to know that ruined sinners are reclaimed by a gracious God who does it at a great cost. Truly, Jesus is my only hope in life and death. For some, this might be new and you've got questions. You'd like to investigate a bit more. Well, get in touch. We'd love to help you. We've been running a Glad You Ask course. We could start another one you could be a part of. You can investigate and find out what you need to know. But for others, you already know this. You know what I've been saying is true, and yet you still have not received God's forgiveness. What's holding you back? Do you think it's accidental that you're listening to this talk today? Do you think that there is no hope for you? We don't deserve this grace from God. It's a free gift. And through Jesus, it is offered to all. If you don't believe me, listen in next week and see the scandal of God's grace about who he calls to be one of his disciples. But, but don't wait until next week to respond to Jesus. You might not get another week. I'm going to pray a prayer that you could use if you want to get right with God today. Let me, let me tell you what I'm going to pray first and so you can know whether you want to pray it yourself. It's a simple prayer. Dear God, I know that I've done things that are wrong. I realize that my biggest problem is my sin. I'm really sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you that your son died in my place. Please change me so I can live with Jesus in charge. It's a simple prayer. It's saying... Sorry, thank you, please. Why don't you pray this prayer right now? This could be a really significant moment in your life if you will just come to Jesus. So please join with me in this prayer if you want to do that right now. I'll pause and let you echo it in your own heart and mind. If you're on your own, you could pray it out loud. Let's pray. Dear God, I know that I've done things that are wrong. I realize that my biggest problem is my sin. I'm really sorry. Please. Forgive me. Thank you that your son died in my place. Please change me so that I can live with Jesus in charge. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, 
then today's been a great day. Jesus wants you to know that he has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And all who come to him, he will receive. So today has been a great day if he has forgiven all your sins. And we'd love to help you to know what it is to follow Jesus. Um, Just email us. Uh, People would be happy to speak to you, help you think about what the next first few steps might be to help you Uh, become someone who uh, grows in their knowledge of Jesus and their trust and knows how to live for him. And my Christian friends, let's, let's share the good news. Jesus is the only one that can be the person who meets people's greatest needs. And we know it. And we get to share him.